Good morning. Welcome to the Rotary Club of Hudson. My name is Marilyn Orr, president of the club, and we are thrilled to have you join us today. This meeting broadcast is available on HCTV, as well as our Rotary of Hudson YouTube channel and Facebook. Our club meets weekly using this digital platform, Zoom. When we meet in person, it's at Laurel Lake Retirement Community for breakfast. We hope to get back to that soon. We meet most Wednesday mornings from 7.15 to 8.30 a.m. So come out to join us for a meeting. We would love to have you as a guest. To learn more about Rotary, our club, and the impact we are having on our local community and the world, please visit our website, rotaryhudson.org. So enjoy this meeting today and help us share the message that Rotary opens doors of opportunity. Good morning, Rotarians and guests. Welcome to the Rotary Club of Hudson. I'm Ron Strobel, the Sergeant at Arms. Our invocation this morning is by Bill Woldridge. We got, we got that far. <laughs> Good morning. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for blessing our mission of service above self. We have so much to be thankful for, our freedoms, our great country, and wonderful town of Hudson, and the opportunity to serve others in our community. As St. Francis said, it is in giving that we receive. Please bless our speaker and what he has to share today. Amen. Thank you, Bill. And now to lead us in the pledge and the four-way test, Jay Yard. Good morning, everyone. Uh, please uh, join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. And now the things that we think, say, and do as Rotarians. Number one, is it the truth? Number two, is it fair to all concerned? Number three, will it build goodwill and better friendships? And number four, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you. Thank you, Jay. And uh, before I introduce our president, I want to just tell you a little bit about what uh, Marilyn and I, my wife and, uh, Joe and Carol Lavella did last Wednesday night, as soon as uh, James pulls up a picture here. We went to the uh, Chagrin Valley Film Festival, and on Wednesday evening at six o'clock, there was a film shown called Open Hearts. Uh, this is a film that was done uh, in 2017 in Haiti, and it filmed the actual heart surgery on a young girl there, uh, patching a hole in her heart. We got to see him stitching the patch on and, and the, the whole thing. Um, the, it started out as just a gift of life. Uh, they wanted something so that they could promote that. And the two uh, producers uh, filming and everything, Travis Pollard and, uh, and Jacob Costelli, uh, once they 
took that and worked on it for about two years, they decided it should become a film. And so they put together this film. Uh, uh, the actual surgery down there for this uh, event was uh, a crew from Italy, but Dr. Jeff Kemp and uh, Ken Fogel, who's been our contact point with uh, Northeast Ohio Gift of Life. Uh, the picture you saw up there was of uh, Travis Pollard receiving out of 97 movies, they won the Service Above Self Award. There were nine awards given, so they got one of the 97. And uh, so just, just thought uh, you might, this is on Saturday evening when they received, that's Ken Follett on uh, your right and Travis Pollitt on this side. It was a wonderful evening and then we had uh, a reception at the M, a uh, great Italian restaurant down there in Chagrin Falls. So it was um, a great evening and it was very, very interesting to see. It takes them three to four days to set up and to um, decide what, which 12 children are going to be operated on over the period of that two weeks out of, uh, well, out of hundreds, which has then uh, gotten down to 40. And of the 40, then they have to choose 12. And basically it's ones that they can do that they know will recover while they're there uh, because they don't have a good ICU uh, and they don't have that much room. So uh, we saw the operation on this girl and then uh, a day or two later, you see him walking around uh, just healthy children. And it's wonderful what Gift of Life does. I know some of you have seen the results uh, showing up at our meetings. And so just wanted, just wanted to let you know what a great evening it was. Thank you. And now our president, Pat Shearer. Thank you, Ron. And it's, a, it's always good to see where some of our Rotarian dollars, especially our international dollars, go to making the difference in the lives of young people around the world. So we've been, we have pent up club announcements because we've completed our candidate series of the, for the city council and for the school board. So we have a number of them uh, this morning. The first is if uh, the International Fellowship of Scouting Rotarians is having a reception um, coming up in on November 20th out at the uh, Medici Art Museum in Howland. Um, for those of you who might, may not be aware, all of the BSA artwork is currently on display at the, the Medici Art Museum, and that includes over 30 Norman Rockwell paintings. Um, so any, uh, there's a, we have uh, flyers out, or out on the table. Otherwise, I'll be happy to get anybody information on that, on that reception. Richard Nebbiola, would you like to talk about the opportunity we have with the food bank? Good morning, Rotarians. I've been the uh, Hudson Rotary representative to the Hudson Food Pantry for the last two years. Uh, some of you may not realize that we have a food pantry here in Hudson because there is a need. The Food Pantry is one of the three organizations under the umbrella of the Hudson Community Service Association. The other two uh, entities are the Holiday Lighting and the Helping Hands. Uh, Bill Libby is recently being appointed as the Rotary representative for the HCSA. And I've been with the Food Pantry as a volunteer. And also I help uh, pick up food from the Canton Akron Food Bank. Uh, most of the food comes from uh, the Canton Akron Food Bank, which is in Akron. Uh, right now, the food has been free to the food pantries. Uh, my wife and I and other volunteers will drive down to uh, Akron, uh, load our SUVs with food and bring it to the food pantry. Uh, the food pantry is physically located at the Rejoice Lutheran Church on Stowe Road, just north of uh, Middleton Road. And it's uh, manned by uh, volunteers and some people from the Lutheran Church help out. 
Uh, distribution day is usually the fourth Saturday of the month. And we've recently changed the name of our customers to neighbors because neighbors is who we serve. And the people that are served are from the uh, Hudson City School District. And um, to be eligible, you have to live with it within that school district and then also meet the federal guidelines for being able to pick up the food. Uh, we need a help from a few Rotarians in the audience. If we could get some help on October the 23rd, distribution day would be from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. And I have a sign-up sheet here with me if you're interested in helping. Um, I'll be there uh, with other volunteers. And basically it's helping people gather up the food from the pantry put it in a uh, shopping cart that we've borrowed from Heinen's and take it out to their car. Some people need some help loading. An example of the need is um, in a recent month during the pandemic, the latest pandemic, uh, we served uh, 37 families and 105 people. So there's still quite a, a need. Um, basically what we give out is uh, dry goods, boxes, cans, bottles, bags of food. And then uh, sometimes there's an opportunity at the food bank to pick up fresh vegetables and fruits, eggs, milk, butter, things like that. Uh, the HSCA recently approved the purchase of a refrigerator freezer, a commercial brand, to install at Rejoice Lutheran Church the special electric line has been installed. Uh, the refrigerator freezer is somewhere on a ship out in uh, Los Angeles off the coast. So however long it takes to get here, but we'll have, we'll have one soon to put in the, in the fresh foods. Um, some of the donations come from not only uh, members of the community, but uh, Panera and Brugger's Bagels donate some baked goods that be given out on distribution day. And sometimes other organizations will bring in butter, milk, and eggs. But right now we can't store those at the food bank. So um, I know I will be there, possibly Bill will be there, <clears throat> and uh, Sue Carter just volunteered. So we need three or four more volunteers to help on October the 23rd. That's a Saturday from about 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Thank you very much. All right, Mike Swain, you have some information on becoming a Rotarian and, and extending the opportunities to becoming a Rotarian. Morning, everyone. I know everybody's been uh, sitting on the edge of your seats waiting to hear how we did in our achieving our uh, membership goal for the first three months of the Rotary year. And I'm gonna get into that. Uh, and I'm gonna apologize to our speaker for taking up a few minutes here, but uh, James, whenever you're ready. Absolutely, so did you hear the one about the uh, here we go. Here we go. So uh, last May, we did a membership update uh, via a Zoom meeting. And um, what I'd like to do here is just uh, uh, review a little bit of, you know, what we said back then, and then go into uh, kind of where we are now. But next slide, please. So back in May, we talked about, you know, where are we now in terms of our membership? You know, where were we then? Uh, where do we want to be? Uh, how are we going to, you know, how do we plan to get there? And what does it look like when we are there? Uh, and what you, and what you folks can do to help. Next one. So I showed this, back then I showed this uh, graph of our membership since the 2014 Rotary year. And you can see we actually had uh, 
some pretty significant growth. In fact, we were ahead of most of the clubs in our, in our district in terms of rate of growth. And then we hit the wall uh, with the pandemic. And actually that started in the 2018, 2019 Rotary year. Uh, where we started to level off, and then the pandemic came along and just exacerbated the, the, the situation. Uh, next one. But uh, when we talked back then, we talked about, you know, why we needed to, to grow our membership. You know, what was, what was it that was so significant about that? Why not just sit back and let things happen and, and let people contact us? Well, first of all, it's good stewardship of the club. Um, growing our membership brings in new skills and talent. It adds to, you know, to future leadership, future potential leadership. Uh, it increases club revenues. And most importantly, it increases our capacity to help serve the community, which is what we're all about. Next one. Uh, and the other thing is in making a case for growth, I, I borrowed from uh, a book from back, in, you know, in, in uh, earlier in the 2000s about double digit growth. And uh, first of all, um, growing enterprises thrive, status quo enterprises vanish. And I feel, you know, you see that all the time. And I feel um, that that's pretty, pretty accurate even uh, applying to Rotary. Um, and you can see clubs, and I've seen the data of clubs that just kind of flounder and start to go downhill because they don't do anything about growth. The other thing is growth is a choice. And, you know, we can sit here and uh, say, well, we've been slammed by the pandemic. There's nothing we can do, but that's not true. Uh, we have a choice to get out there and try to make something happen. And that's what we're going to do. Uh, next one. So back uh, in 2019, 2020, the membership committee put together a strategy for growth. And in this May uh, presentation, we, we shared that with everyone. On the next slide, please. Um, but it all centered around um, an objective that we developed. And again, this was back in 2019 uh, of achieving a total membership of 72 by 2022. And at that point, we were sitting at that where the curve had leveled off and we were sitting at a membership level of 60. And we said by July of 22, and again, this is in 2019, that we were going to be at 72 members. Um, and the way we were going to do that, we laid out a set of action plans and the, the, the punchline action plan was the last one, which said, we need to get everyone involved. Um, all our members should really be involved in helping to recruit new members. It's part of the, that's part of the deal here, uh, as a Rotarian, each, each member has a responsibility to help the club grow and succeed in its mission to serve the community. Next slide. Uh, and the way we do that is, one of the ways we do that is we use our speakers uh, to help attract uh, new members. We, we publicize uh, who is coming to talk to us and we tell people about it and we try to match people's interests with the speaker's topics to, to get people interested in Rotary. We also said back then we had the new membership folder available and we since have given seven, several of those out. And finally, we said we were gonna track how we were doing and publish uh, updates quarterly. So the next slide, that leads right into um, the main thing I wanted to show you today. And here's where we are. Uh, if you take our goal, which we have not revised, that was developed back in 2019, uh, we're still at a goal of 72. Um, and what that says, and, and the baseline was still 60 this, this past May. Uh, so we had not grown at all since we developed that goal. Uh, and again, we can blame it on the pandemic, but we can also, we have a choice to go out and try to do something about it, which we are doing. So if you break that increase of 12 out quarterly across our four rotary quarters, uh, our quarter one goal, which ended in, at the end of September, was 63, and that's where we are uh, today at 63 when the board will approve two new members that, that came in in September. Um, and that, again, that was against that, that 2021 20, baseline of, of 60 members. So the next slide. 
the two new members, uh, Jerry Zemlicka, who's here this morning, and Tom Petropoulos, who's usually with us on Zoom. I can't tell if, if, if he is. And then uh, Joe Rusnak was approved by the board back in uh, August. Okay, next one. So those other action plans I talked about, uh, just to get those back in front of you, uh, and these had a bunch of uh, bullets under them, but basically we said we were gonna continue our local publicity efforts, uh, which is spearheaded by Jay Yard, doing a great job there. Uh, make the new member information folder available, increase exposure in the community, and improve our retention of, of existing members. So that, that wraps up the rest of our, our strategic plan, action plans with a bunch of bullets in, in that go with all of those that I won't uh, go into now. But it still gets back to this thing of getting everyone involved and all our members need to be involved in helping to recruit. So I again, solicit your uh, attention to that. And uh, please you know, give some thought to who you might invite and when and you know, bring them along as a guest or have them join by Zoom. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, and you know, in that whole thing about what you can do to help, the next slide, invite somebody to join Rotary. It's as simple as that. All you gotta do is ask someone to join. I used the example back in May of uh, the Nordonia Club who uh, increased their membership from 25 to 40 in one year just by going on a campaign to have each member ask someone to join Rotary. So that's it. Thanks very much. Thanks for your time. One thing that I think Mike didn't hit on is it's never been easier to be a member of the Hudson Rotary Club than it is today. You can participate via Zoom. You can be here in person so if you have a if you have a meetings or those kind of things, you can participate from work or you can be here physically in person. So being a Rotarian is easier today than it's probably ever been in the history of, the, of our club. So extending our club membership, it will make make a greater impact on our Hudson community. A couple of other quick announcements. There will be a foundation committee meeting next week, immediately following our meeting. There is a board meeting today following today's meeting. And Rich, do you want to come up and talk about the fall fundraiser? Rich Warfield. I know he's normally up there. He's, he's normally that little picture up on the top up there. But Thank you, Pat. Um, so that's kind of true that I'm up there, but now that Ron is going on vacation the next two weeks, I have to be here, he told me today. So you'll be seeing more of me physically. Um, <laughs> so what you see out there that Pat and I, Marilyn and Dana from my office have been working on, and this is on behalf of Tom Page, it's the fall fundraiser event. And we really need your participation. Just like Mike Swain said, hey, we want new members. We need you to participate now. I didn't confirm this with Pat because I forgot to this morning, but in lieu of participating, I think we said you could just write a check for $100, right? Correct. So $100, if you don't feel like, you know, filling these out and recruiting people to, well, you'd be buying on their behalf or collecting money for them. The um, caramel corn and the white cheddar popcorn, Pat has been kind enough to use the Boy Scouts buying power platform to get these for us. And they are $10 each. So um, pick which one you want, complete your form and return it by November 10th. Okay, because these are gonna be delivered between the week of um, November 24th and um, I'll have them for all of you on the 1st of December. As you know, we don't have a meeting on the 24th. So they'll be shipped to my office and I'll keep them there. I'll probably try to get the flowers delayed as long as possible because we all know they don't last as long as the caramel corn and also the cheddar popcorn. So anyway, the flowers are the other item. We've decided, Marilyn, myself, and Pat, that the roses just don't last that long. So we're going to go with like a flower arrangement. And we're pretty much using the same person to help us with the roses. Um, they're $35 each, okay? So... Uh, they'll make a very pretty gift 
for your loved ones, for your spouse, if you're uh, like some of us that play too much golf and need to, you know, make it up. So um, we really need your participation. I think that's all I've got to say, Pat. Thank you, Rich. So remember that deadline is November 10th. We need all orders in by November 10th. You do have the opportunity if you should, should so choose not to participate. There is a $100 contribution to the Rotary Club Foundation. Um, all the funds from this fall fundraiser and um, our go-to directly to the scholarships that we uh, will hand out this upcoming spring. Um, so on the flowers, our net, our club's net profit is $15, and on the popcorn, it's $7 a container. So if you get somewhere in between, and then you know how much you have to write your check for, if you don't get to at least $100 in net profit to the club, okay? So reminder, all orders are due uh, November, November 10th, and it'll be the, our first meeting in December will be the delivery date. All right. Our quote for the day, someone is sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree a long time ago, Warren Buffett. And uh, I, I have an opportunity to introduce our speaker today. Arthur Bright has been involved in the medical industry since 1980 as a sales representative, sales manager, national sales trainer, and is a nationally recognized as one of the leading corporate speakers in the medical field. He has won numerous awards for his sales performance, management, and management training. Arthur is the number one best-selling author, interview expert, and national international keynote speaker who has spoken all over the world with his message of proven success. He's been a, a national radio talk show host and conducts national radio interviews regarding his proven formula for winning. Arthur Bright brings his four C's method of success combined with 34 years of experience in the medical industry to bring out the extraordinary in all. This presentation is dynamic, passionate, humorous, and educational as he shows, uh, shows how to apply his proven principles. He has proven to large and small corporations along with medical practices throughout the country on leadership to show the importance of creating a winning atmosphere to any product, service, or business. Arthur's unique presentations provide a clear direction utilizing stories, career application, and audience participation while making everyone feel important in building for process, in building for success. Without any further ado, Arthur Bright. Thank you so much. Um, I, I didn't write that, I swear. I, every time I hear that, I go, I gotta maybe change that, but I hope this guy is good. So. Let me tell you, first of all, that Barlow Road construction thing as I'm driving here, I'm like, what, what am I going to do? So then you go around the other side and on the other side, the detour says the same thing. So I think I ticked off a few people driving, just kept going and kind of got here. So ah, I'm breathing now, but um, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. As you know, my name is Arthur Bright. I am a motivational speaker and a, an author, but I'm also a pastor. And that has been a very, very important part of my life. It's changed so many things, especially halfway through my life and really given me a plan. And today I wanna to talk to you about leadership and leadership, not just in business, but leadership in life, how you're gonna be a leader in all aspects of your life. And being a leader is not someone who dictates and tells people what to do and it's all about them. It's how you build other leaders around you. It's how you lift people up. You reach them at a humane level and really make a difference in a positive way for everybody. In my career, I was in sales and sales management for 37 years. The first 11 years, I was in a sales position, which, by the way, is a leadership position. It's, it's a leadership position. Your customer, your company is looking for you to come, move forward, to take control, and really bring everybody together for a positive experience. And in those 11 years, I was salesman of the year six times, and it wasn't because I'm some glib talking, fast talking salesman, but what I'm gonna share with you today, it's reaching people, connecting people at a human level, building those relationships each and every time. And then the last 26 years, I was a national sales manager and a regional sales manager. Uh, once again, my team was winning the awards and people would come over or I'd hype and they go, I've never worked in this kind of atmosphere. Leadership is about creating a positive atmosphere where people feel uplifted, feel empowered, and that you really are all making a difference each and every time. 
And in my book, Successful Managers Must Lead, I talk about the fact we got to build leaders. You know, I'd see, I'd see people get promoted and they had this attitude like they're the grand mystic high ruler and it's all about them and you will do it my way and only my way. No, that's not why you got put in that position. You got put in that position to lift people up, to empower people, to make a difference in a positive way. And I have a quote in the book that says this, if you choose to lead by yourself, the only person you're gonna lead is yourself. Leaders build other leaders each and every time. And I had um, stories in the book, and one of them is this. Um, 360 scores are where your team anonymously rates you. So I got a call from my national sales manager. I was a regional at the time, and I see who it is. I pick up the phone. And I say, hey, Rick, don't you love when people do this? The first, his first response is, what are you doing? Not even a hi. I'm like, uh, talking to you? And he goes, no, what are you doing? I just got back your 360 scores and they're the highest scores in the 40 year history of the company. And you guys win the awards every year. What are you doing? I said, well, Rick, I'll tell you what we do. Am I good here, by the way? I just wanna make sure. Okay, cool. Now you gotta get used to this. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate it. So I said, he said, well, what are you doing? I said, well, I'll tell you the truth, Rick. We don't have titles on our team. Everybody's the same. We work together, we support each other. It's not labor management, it's not us and them. And I said, Rick, I'm in the business of building leaders. I want those people to know they can go out, be supported, be empowered, and make a difference with their customers, as well as with their loved ones at home. I want them to be leaders throughout. Probably a longer answer than he was looking for. But what he said, well, whatever you're doing, I got to have you train the other managers because you guys are killing it every year and your team loves you. It's further validation when you treat people the way you want to be treated, everybody wins. In the good book, they talk about the golden rule, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Well, that's exactly what we're talking about here. You want to be able to give to others and to treat people the way you want to be treated. And it didn't matter who was on my team. My team would change from year to year. They'd realign, they'd whomever, we'd have to hire people. Whoever was on my team was part of that. We're going to support each other. We're going to be working for each other. We're going to be there. It's not, we're not competing with each other. We're building together. And one time I had a guy named Jeff. He was going to come over from Albany. And Jeff was real intense. He's one of these guys who love to chew on the numbers and, and analyze. And God bless him. I wasn't quite that way, but God bless him. So I called him up in um, mid-December mid to let him know, hey, as of January, you're on the team. And uh, he goes, I heard that might happen. So I checked up on you. I'm like, oh, geez, did, how did I do? He said, everybody said, I'm going to have a great year and I'm going to have so much fun. I said, well, Jeff, you are. We can't wait for you to come over here. We, you, know, you, you can add a lot to our team, and we're there for you and support you. But he said the word fun. Are we allowed to have fun in leadership and in business? Oh, you better. Absolutely. When you're having fun, the stress goes away. People are doing things because they want to, not because they have to. And their performance and everything improves. So halfway through the year, he does it again. He comes up to me and he goes, as a salesman, he goes, I think I figured you out. I'm like, uh-oh, he's on to me. He goes, you don't manage the numbers. You manage the behavior. I said, you're exactly right. If I manage those numbers, when your numbers are good, you're my buddy. When they're not, mm, no one wants that. No one wants to be treated that way. No one should be treated that way. If things are going tough and we all have our tough times, let's figure out a way. I'll get them help. We'd figure out whatever we need to do. I'd have people realigned into my region who are on performance plans. And people are like, they come over here and we, the help we could give them, their production just came, just rose. That's reaching people and treating people the way you would want to be treated each and every time. Let's see if I can do this. Did I get it? Oh. oh. Uh, I don't have to. Okay. And no, I don't have a good joke. I wish I did. Well, I don't know if I could say it here. Let's just leave it at that. Try that. Next slide. Okay. All right. There we go. Now, when I do seminars and what I've been talking about building leaders, I'll just leave that up there then before I drop it. So um, I talk to people about building relationships. And I'm talking about, I talk to all different kinds of groups, international CEOs, all, and I talk to inmates at Grafton Correctional. 
all everybody. And I talked to him about the formula for building relationships with people is respect plus trust equals that relationship. You show someone respect and that respect is returned. It builds a trust, which is the foundation for every relationship in your life each and every time. But there are three things that are necessary to garner that respect and build the trust. Integrity, honesty, humanity. People want to see integrity in leadership. They want a good, moral, ethical human being. Not too much to ask. They also want someone who's going to be honest with them. Someone who's, I didn't want someone playing games with me, so why would I do it to them? But we'd be straight up. I don't care about titles. No one's on a pedestal. No one's being looked down. We're right here. Be honest with them, and most importantly is humanity. We are first and foremost human beings, and that is, tends to be lost in business. Well, we can't, no. You treat people the way you want to be treated, and you lift them up, and you treat them with that integrity and honesty, you'll see the change in their performance. And you've also given them a blueprint on how they can be in their business as well as in their personal life. You become, as a leader, you are there to, to help and to guide people and help develop people each and every time. <clears throat> So integrity, honesty, and humanity, that's what you want to see. That's what people want to see in leadership. Well, guess what? That's what I want to see in my team. I wanted all my, my sales reps to feel that they were leaders. I wanted to build them, but I was looking for integrity, honesty, and humanity, most importantly. In my career, I hired over 200 people. And in that time, 85% of those people did not have, quote, the strongest resume, but 90% of them made sales clubs, presidents club for sales ex Excellence. Why? They had integrity. They had honesty. They had humanity. I knew their customers trust them, respect them. Everybody did. Each and every time. And so when I would be hiring people, I developed a great relationship with two recruiters in my career. They knew what I wanted. I knew what I'd get from them. And they always said, you're unique in the fact that, yeah, you care about their backgrounds and what they've done. But you always ask questions like, what's their character like? What are these people like? What's the value? What do you see in this person that makes them special? I said, exactly, because that's what the customer and everybody on my team is going to be around. And one of my favorite stories is, is I have an opening in Lexington, Kentucky. And so I'm working with the two recruiters. And we come up with five candidates I'm going to go in and see the file in two weeks. One of the recruiters calls me up and he starts laughing. I go, what do you got? And he goes, I, just listen to me. I know how you are about resumes, but you got to hear this. You just, this guy's unique. I said, well, tell me about him. He says, well, he, he, uh, works at Disney World, but he wants to move back to Lexington. I go, I'm listening, Disney. And I said, what does he do there? Is he in sales? And he said, well, he did, he's done some production work and he's done some other things. And then he starts laughing. He goes, and um, he's Tigger in the Disney parade, but you got to see him. I go, you're this geeked about Tigger. I got to meet this guy. So I go in two weeks to see five people in Tigger, whose name is Brad. And he had no real formal sales experience blew me away. This guy, I'm saying, these people are going to love him. He had gone out and done research. He had gone to some medical conferences, talked to doctors and nurses. He had looked at our videos on, this kid was prepared, but more it was about him. But I'm thinking, can I really do this? So three rounds of interviews took about a month. I did. I hired Tigger and people are like, did you really? I go, you got to see this guy. 20 years later, he's still doing great out there. I've seen him at conferences. He thanks me. I said, hey, you did it. Hire the person, not the resume. I tell people that all the time. I had a gal come over in, in uh, Omaha, similar thing. She had some sales experience, but not in medical. The recruiter says, you got to see her. I did. I hired her. She did great. She's now president of her own startup company. Hire the person, not the resume. Another thing I tell people to do is to lead. Don't manage. I know the term is manager, but people like to micromanage, be all over people. Ugh, who wants that? That's toxic. I've seen so many good people leave companies because that person's all over them. You gotta micromanage somebody. You either you need more training, that person needs more training, or you got the wrong person. And it's usually moi needs more training because you do not want to be treated like that. You know that's not a good way to go. So lead people, show them through your examples and all that you do, the support and developing that you can do. And all those three things that I talked about each and every time. Remember this, people don't leave companies. People leave people. I saw it all the time. 
good people going, I can't work for this person. It's so important. People also stay because of people. I had all these people doing wonderful. They were very successful winning awards. And they said, we get called by recruiters all the time. We can't leave. We don't know if we'll get another one of you. You want to be known as someone who's good at what they do and an even better person. That's true leadership, being that better person each and every time. And I, had a, I was going to get Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> Great town. I was so excited. And the rep down there was Chad. I kind of knew Chad, but I called up his manager as a courtesy to find out. And his manager was one of these arrogant, it's all about him kind of guys, but I had a call. So he says, no, you're going to get rid of Chad. I got him on a performance plan, blah, blah, blah. He was a real micromanager. I said, okay, I'm a big boy. I'll go down and see, go down to Nashville. Rockstar. Oh my gosh, he was so excited. He had the whole year planned out. We went and saw his accounts. He was fired up. But he told me he had two interviews set up. He said, if I got to work for that guy, if I had to work for that guy anymore, I was gone. I couldn't take it. Chad ended up being the number one sales rep that year out of 44 people. Had another good year. The following year, they realigned him out. Came back into my region a second time. He was number one again. Went out to dinner with he and his wife the following year. And halfway through the meal, his wife does one of these. I need to tell you something. Like, oh, okay. She goes, I always know when my husband's working for you. He's a better person. He's a better husband. He's a better father, happier person. He does better at his job because of how you treat him. I said, I was humbled. I said, Amber, Chad's the one who did. She goes, I don't know. I get it. It's how you treat people. You be good at what you do and be a better person. Treat people the way you want to be treated. And you'll watch their production go up because now they're feeling positive. And the stress goes away and they're feeling just incredibly good about all that. <laughs> uh, next one. Cool. No, it's all, it's all good. Um, I talk to people about in leadership, the necessity for emotional stability. And people are like, what's that? Emotional stability is taking on a need, person, item, challenge, whatever comes up. And it does, both in your business life and your personal life, especially if you got kids, stuff comes up. Well, you want to be able to deal with it. They're coming to you in an emotionally stable way. You don't want to lose it. People would be like, I can't go to my boss. They lose it every time. Well, that's not humane. That's not treating somebody how you want to. They don't respect it. They don't trust it. So I came up with my four-step bright plan. And what I did is I used this not only in business and in my personal life, but what it does is you'll come up with a non-emotional information, all the information you needed, the best decision. And here's what you do. It's four steps. If you identify options, analyze, and decide, and let me walk you through it. First of all, if there's more than one thing, separate, take each thing individually. People will go like, oh, throw it all in together. We'll take it on. Yeah, you know, we know that that's gone. But he's going to get overwhelmed and ah, lose it. Someone comes to you with something, or if you have something, you first of all identify that singular. What is that need person item challenge? Now we're going to look at the options. And if you're working with somebody else, get their input, because that gives them the opportunity to feel part of it, plus the fact that they're usually closer to the situation. As leaders, we're not all knowing. We're all gathering. So once you, get, once you start putting down those options, you go, okay, we got something. We can handle this. I don't care how crazy they are. Then you analyze, and once again, getting everybody's input, so everybody buys into it, and then you decide. And when you decide, you've come up with the most non-emotional, well-informed decision. You've also given the person on your team a blueprint. This is how you can be in your business life as well as your personal life with your loved ones. I was speaking at a conference years back with some other people, and one of the speakers got up on stage. And he talked about the fact that he was the most blessed man, the luckiest man on earth. He's got a beautiful wife, three beautiful kids. Lives on a 2,000 acre farm in Utah and does what he loves to do. Sounds like a great life. Nine months before he started public speaking, a one ton bale of hay fell on him, broke his neck. He's a quadriplegic, confined to a wheelchair the rest of his life. Most blessed man, luckiest man. Those are his words. And he talked about that first night being in the hospital room, and I can't even begin to imagine the sadness. His wife and his kids are there, and he's laying there with a myriad of things going through, our, through his head. He says, Dad walked in the room. Dad walked up to him, and he said, I could tell my dad was crying. Of course, it's his child. His dad walks up to him, kisses him on the forehead. 
He said, I love you, son. I'm here for you. He said, all I could say was, my life's over, dad. He goes, I understand. I'm here for you. Day and a half later, his dad brought another quadriplegic into the room. And for five hours, they talked about how he was going to deal with his wife, his kids, someone taking care of him. What was he going to you talk about challenges. If this dude can handle it, we can handle anything. And he said, Arthur, just like you said, I couldn't have begun to move forward in my life until I took each thing individually and was able to rectify that and have a plan for it. And now look at what he's doing. He's going out and touching so many other people's lives. An amazing thing. That's what emotional stability can and will do for you each and every time. I think it's the next one. So when I do... Am I good right here? When I, when I do my consulting and, and all, I ask people, what do you want to see in leadership that's going to make you successful? And here's what they came up with. First of all, they said, just give me a real genuine person. I mean, come on, just be someone right here. Not someone with an attitude, arrogance, not someone who's looking down or want, no. Just give me something, somebody that I can feel comfortable with. People say, you treat your team like they're my, your friends. They are my friends. And oh, by the way, they're my customers. My best product are my people. And they wanted that real genuine person that they could relate to. And with that comes a passion. When you see passion in leadership, people want to be part of it because it's real. It's genuine. They appreciate it. It's good. It's wholesome. Another thing they wanted to feel a connection with leadership. And I'm talking more about connection, my four C's. But connection, they didn't want this labor management. They wanted, we're on the same team. People would say, man, it's the first time I felt like we're working together. Absolutely. That's what makes it fun. They wanted someone who was positive. Oh, grumpy Gus. And if there's a Gus here, I apologize. But oh, people would be like, hey, my boss is so negative. Well, that's no good. That's not respectful. That's not how you would want to be treated each and every time. They wanted someone who could inspire them, not with their actions, more with their words. Heck, in my early, <laughs> I'd go into the OR and people like, Arthur, you inspired us, but you had everything ready. I go, whoa, 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 wait a second. You people are doing surgery. You're helping people with their quality of life. Inspiration's everywhere, and it's by our actions because that's what people feed off of. People wanted leadership to have a vision, not just for the company, but for them. The 200 plus hires I had, many got promoted because they'd come to me and say, hey, love working here. Want to move up with the company, like working with you. Someone helped me. I'd send them into the home office, get them exposure. I'd have them work on some things with me so that they were developing and felt that they mattered. But I let them know, I care about you. We care. We're working together. And it really, really gave them a sense that of purpose. They wanted someone who was organized. In other words, I'd tell my reps, you go out and do the hard work. You guys need something. Come back to me. I'll, I'll take care of it. I got it. Yes, I am highly OCD, but it's a different kind of thing. I had great relationships with people in the home office. I could get stuff done. They all said they wanted someone who had integrity, who was a good moral person. And the last thing they said is, we just want to have fun. We want to enjoy what we're doing. Heck yeah, you're working so much of your life, you better have fun. Because when you have fun, once again, most productive, learn the most and do your best work. And that's what people would say, coming over here is just having so much fun. I do want to talk to you about fun in leadership, though. There's a right kind of fun, and there's a wrong kind of fun, and there's not a thin line. No. Oh, I'd see some people get promoted, like, those rules don't apply to me anymore. I can do whatever I want. Yeah, no, you can't. Uh-uh. There's no getting around it. My, my second manager in my career was absolutely a pig. And we, the way he addressed the females in the office, and we called him out. <laughs> Just kidding. No, you weren't. I didn't mean it. Yes, you did. That's somebody's loved one. Would you want your loved one being disrespected? Don't. No, you wouldn't. So don't do it to somebody else. And I saw it so constantly in all areas. And I'm talking about off-colored jokes, off-colored comments, some names. Yeah. Sexual innuendos. And oh, by the way, the hands on the shoulders, people come up, don't do that. It's creepy. You're creeping them out. You're creeping me out. Keep your hands off them. And every time I give this talk, I have people, especially women, come back going, thank you. Leave them alone. Somebody's loved one. Respect them. Now, I will say this as one caveat. You can have names, but both sides need to be, feel respectful it, that you'd be comfortable calling that person that name. And it can bring you closer. I had a guy who worked for me for many years. He called himself Mr. Rogers. It fit. He was. Good dude. That's who he was. I had a guy who played basketball at Butler. His dad played for the Cavs, Dave Robish. This was Scott Robish. 
Six eleven, big guy. Try walking down the hallway with someone six eleven. No one's looking at you. I can tell you that much. That's tall. I'm like wow. I had a guy who served two tours in Afghanistan. He was a captain in the army. I called him captain. Absolutely. Thank you for your service. And then the last, I had Tanya. I had Tanya. She came over into my, and we're still friends. But she was reeling on about her last boss. And, and this is when the ad campaign had just started. I looked at her and go, oh, my gosh, I got to get you a Snickers bar. And she goes, that's who I am. I'm Snickers. I go, really? Okay, you picked it. And um, people got to know her as that. And at meetings, she'd get a bunch of Snickers bars. Her Twitter name is Dr. Snickers. Okay? So you can have these things that bring you together and bring you closer. But you want to make sure that both sides are going to feel respected and that they're going to feel good about it. You get promoted, you get into a position of leadership two ways. You're either promoted or you're hired in. I got both. The first position I got as manager, I was promoted with the team I'd been with for four years. So now it's all about me. I'm the one in charge. They'll do it my way. Heck no. These are my friends. Are you kidding me? I gleaned what I really liked from former managers. And then that other garbage, ugh, I got rid of. No. And we had a great time. Ended up being the number one region that year. It's like, I knew it. Treat people the way you want to be treated. And this is what happens. I also got, <laughs> excuse me, I got uh, hired by a company, an excellent medical company. I knew a lot of people over there. And they had started a division in another specialty that I wasn't, so it wasn't a competing thing. And they came to me and they said, uh, <sighs> The vision's not going where we want. Wanted to know if you'd be interested in coming on as the national sales manager. I was very humbled. I said, absolutely, but I didn't know, didn't know the culture. So I said, uh, you know how I do things. Is that all right? They go, you do what you do. I said, great. So now I had 14 sales reps across the country who didn't know me, the reps, and they were worried about two things. They heard they might close the division. So they're out of a job. And number two, who's this new guy they're going to, I know they're going to bring somebody in all over us. So I called up each one of them individually. I told them about respect, trust, relationships, integrity, honesty, humanity. I said, this is our time. We're going to have so much fun. And they're like, whoa, we were not expecting this. And I got them all on a conference call. I said, listen, and I knew some of the things I wanted to do, which were going to be radically different than what they were doing, but I want to hear from my leaders. So I said, um, what do we need to do to turn this around? First person said, well, <laughs> I've always thought we should do this and this, but they said we couldn't. I said, forget the but they said they can. We get to do it our time, our plan. We're going to make thing, we're gonna make something brand new up. Oh my gosh, I got 14 leaders on the phone. They are like going back and forth and they want to do it. By the time we got off the phone, we had a plan. It was their plan. <clears throat> that year, and they were excited. That year, we went from $300,000 to $4.1 million. They did it, their plan. And they said they never had so much fun and they made a lot of money. <laughs> I had a VP come up to me at uh, the next sales meeting and go, what did you do? Sometimes I tend to be a little too honest. I said, honestly, not a whole lot. They did it. And they, they were really the ones who did it. And, but it's me empowering them, me building other leaders. But in the end, it was them doing it. He says, unbelievable. That's what you can do when you empower people and may, let people know they have a purpose, that they matter, that they can do this and they're going to have the support. I'm going to tell the next one then. Um, thank you. Talked about my four C's, uh, my trademark four C's for success. And I present these to all different types of groups. These are how you bring relationships, teams together, really make yourself feel better and really feel empowered. And I present these, I'm very blessed. Twice a year, I get to go to Europe and present to an international CEO leadership conference. I also present these at Grafton to inmates, to everybody. And what these four C's do is they do bring you together and really empower you to be the best person you can. And I use hand signals because sometimes when I go international, <laughs> there, uh, there's a language barrier. So it's commitment, communication, connection, and create. Let's take a look. First thing your team wants to see from you, your loved ones want to see from you, people in life want to see your commitment. Not just to the job, but to them. Like I said, my best product were my people. But people want to know you're committed, that you are who you are, you're true to your word, you have integrity. And with that, with that commitment comes that passion I talked about. And that's where people go, yeah, this is something. We believe in him, and he believes in us. The second is communication. 
You have to be clear in your communication to your team. Deliver information, directives, whatever it is, the way you'd want to receive it. Clear, concise, simple, to the point. People go, I don't understand what my manager wants. Well, that's not respectful. That's not treating with humanity, and they don't trust you. And the most important communication skill you have in business, in leadership, and in life is your ability to listen. Not hear, listen. You got two ears and one mouth. That's why you listen twice as much as you speak. Why? We don't learn when we're speaking. We learn when we listen and observe. Remember, we're all gathering, not all knowing. You ask anybody in business or your loved ones or somebody a question, just listen to them. Don't do one of these. Yeah, no. Listen to them because when you do, you show respect. Respect's return, trust is built. So you've got commitment and communication. The third, you form that connection I was talking about earlier. Connection says you're important, you matter, you're part of the team. And when people feel that, they're doing things because they want to, not because they have to. This is something now they're fired up about. And when you do those, when you show commitment, communication, and connection, the fourth is you create an atmosphere where people are empowered, people listen, are listened to, people matter, people are fired up, people are helping, people are supporting. And when you give them those four C's, you give them two more, you give people the confidence that they matter, they have a purpose, and that they can be successful and the control to go on out and do it each and every time. I'll finish up with the story regarding that. I was speaking at a conference once again, and there was a, a naval commander. And he talked about the fact when he got his first naval ship, it was the lowest performing ship in the Navy. I said, well, how's that? I, I thought they all kind of had the same orders. He says, Arthur, just like you said, the previous, they didn't feel that the previous <clears throat> commander listened to him. He didn't connect with them. He, all, he goes, all, everything you talk about, there was no relationship. So he said, the first day, I get all the sailors out on deck, and they're all going, okay, who's, who's the new guy here? And he said, I'm so happy to be part of our ship, not mine, our. And we're going to do great things together. I need your help. My door's always open. Now they're looking at him like, who are you and where you been? Next day, in comes a, uh, a sailor. He says, thank you, sailor. Have a seat. What do you got? Sailor pulls out a nut and bolt from the ship, but it's gigantic. He's holding it like this. He says, sir. We have thousands and thousands of these on this ship. And get this, every six months, we got to replace them all because they rust from the high seas, the salt water, the wind. And sir, we've been asking for better coding, but he wouldn't listen. We hate doing this. We could be doing other things. He's sitting there going, not bad. He went on and ordered the more expensive with the better coding. They didn't last six months. They lasted two years. That gave those sailors time to do other things, but more importantly, they knew he was committed to them. He showed them a passion. He listened to them. He communicated with them. He showed them respect. He built their trust. He connected with them. And in two years, they went from being the lowest performing ship in the Navy to the highest, outhouse to penthouse, because he showed them they mattered. He cared. Everybody coming together. And that's really what those four C's will do for each and every one of you. Ladies and gentlemen, know when you show someone respect, that respect is returned and a trust is built, and it forms that relationship. Do it with integrity, with honesty, and humanity. Be that person who is committed, who communicates and listens to people, who connects with people, and creates an atmosphere where everybody has the confidence and control to be successful, and you will be that person who is good at what they do, and an even better person, and that's true, true leadership. I once again thank you all because I tell you, the speaking business has been shut down as you can imagine for the past year and a half and it's so great to be back doing what I'm doing. I thank you sincerely for this opportunity to do this. <clears throat> know that you can make a difference and we all can be leaders in all aspects of our life. I do have books here. I'll answer any questions you guys have. I thank you for your time today. I'm Arthur Bright, have a wonderful day. Thank you very much, Arthur. Just a reminder, we have a board meeting, a club board meeting immediately following our meeting here today. And we have our drawing. Ooh, the payout is $10. <laughs> 
Arthur, you don't know that that's a, that's almost like a 10% increase. <laughs> so, Arthur, would you come pick a ticket or, or go, go, or I'll let you pick a ticket then. Somebody's dog is very excited about that other dollar. That's a true toy. There we go. 716-713-716-713. Mike Swain. Oh, donating it back to the club. All right. Verify that there's a black marble still in there, Mike. All right. The jackpot is $251. Yep, ready. Oh, no. Jackpot will grow. Nope. Right away, the treasurer wants the $10 back. There we go. All right. And because we're starting the fall product sale, today's dad joke goes perfectly with our fall product sale. What did the baby corn say to the mama corn? Where's popcorn? <laughs> <laughs>